All right, so I just want to switch back to my computer to get started. Just to introduce what's going to happen. Okay, hi. Um, so let's get started. So this is our first sort of Wednesday session where we're going to be doing presentations and practicals. So what we're going to do today, we have to start off, we, ha we have a couple of, we have two student presentations. Um, as I was saying, the, your, your responsibility, if you're not presenting, uh, is to um, listen and participate and discuss. And then afterwards, um, we're going to collect you know, peer assessments of each of the presentations. So the way you do that is you send an email to Byung Suk, um, one for each presentation using a template I just sent out to the class uh, in email that just briefly just you know, gives the name of the presenter, the title, your marks out of 10, and then maybe one or two line comment. And then what we'll do is we'll gather up all those uh, assessments for each presentation. We'll average the grades. That'll be the grade for that student for that presentation. And then we'll collect up all the comments and anonymously send them to the presenter so they get some feedback. Um, so hopefully that will work out. And uh, like I say, please be constructive and uh, supportive of one another, including in the comments. And uh, um, you know. That hopefully that'll that'll work out nicely. Um, and then after the presentations, we're going to be doing the practical. I guess um, I'll introduce that once we've got the presentations done. So we have uh, Shay and, and Mike. You want to go first, Shay? Sure. Great. And uh, so this mic is for the. We put it on one is all yeah. large thing. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Shay. I'll be doing a short presentation on speech recognition, and Mike will follow up with um, a talk on autocorrelation. So speech recognition is um, is everywhere today. It's growing. It's a rising uh, demand, and we find it in uh, voice commands with like call, making cell phone calls or regular calls, um, helping with pronunciation if you're trying to learn a language or something. Uh, also, if you're talking on the phone and you need to enter some information, they ask you to, you know, give you a credit card or something like that. It's been uh, growing in video games, and uh, speech to text is a big one. I know I use that one. It's good for when you're like driving in the car. You don't want to be looking down. Um, then robotics and air control. So the first uh, speech recognition that we saw was in 1961. Um, an IBMer named William Dirsch uh, created this machine. And it was showcased in 1962 at the World's Fair. Um, basically, it recognized 16 spoken words, 0 through 9, and plus, minus, total, stuff like that. So you would talk into the mic and say 9 minus 7 total. And then on that little screen right here, it gives the answer. Uh, so how it worked was pretty interesting. 
he basically recognized that the numbers and minus the, of the 16 words that he chose to recognize, there was a, basically a front, middle, and end. Some of them had just a middle and an end, though. I mean, a front and, a, and an end. And he did it according to pitch. So they each had a unique uh, pitch between the first, middle, and last. So like five, kind of go high, medium, high. Zero, you pitch goes down as you say it. So each word was breaking into, broken into the three uh, separate segments and then passed through a three different filters. And um, then it would go through a bunch of logic and it would figure out what it was, what you were tell, asking it, what you were asking it, and then it would, it would illuminate the, the correct answer. So uh, that should say 1962, the first one. But it grew pretty, pretty fast, pretty rapidly. Um, you'd see by 85, a uh, computer could recognize 1,000 words. And then two years later, um, we passed into the human vocabulary range. And then in 2006, Google um, put together a one trillion uh, word recognition computer. Um, similarly, the accuracy went up. Uh, the accuracy is measured by uh, wrong guesses by the computer as w at what you say. Um, so in 93, it was still pretty bad, um, even though we could recognize tens of thousands. And uh, they realized in 2001 it reached about 80%, and it hasn't gotten any better than that, but that's, that's pretty good. So nowadays, uh, speech recognition is a blend of two different modeling schemes. Um, with language modeling, it goes based on probabilities of what it guesses you're going to say next based on the word you just said, or what the word you, it thinks you just said. And then acoustic modeling goes on probabilities of sounds, so halfway through a word, it, it keeps eliminating what it thinks you're going to say, or what it thinks you're saying, trying to say. And so that's the basis of um, making the assumption that we estimate that speech is a Markov process. And Markov process is basically that you make a prediction of what is going to happen based on what is happening in the present tense. So we can use stochastic modeling. So as I just said, we now we estimate that speech is a, uh, a stationary process. So if we break speech up into little segments based on the on what sound you're emitting right now, it will eliminate what it th it'll eliminate possible possibilities of what you're trying to say based on Gaussian distributions of what comes after a certain sound and it's kind of like when you're doing a text message and it's predicting what you're going to say before you finish the the word in that every letter you say it eliminates more possibilities and it says it takes a guess at what the most likely word is that you're actually trying to write, or in this case, say. So, I'll turn it over to Mike. I don't know, let's, let's, uh, oh. Let, let's, oh, sure. Let's, I'll you. take any questions. Uh, <laughs> so that, was, that was a very nice presentation. Thank you for um, volunteering to go first and doing all the other stuff. Yeah. And, but, uh, let, will you answer some questions? Sure, yeah. yeah. So, any any questions for Shay? I, I flirted a little bit in speech recognition, and um, one of the things is it's like it's, it's because it becomes so important to measure the accuracy, mm -hmm. there's like a huge number of variables in terms of you, know, you can have the same system and you can you know, measure it one way and get 80% and measure it another way and get 99% or something. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, 80% sounds pretty bad actually to me. I, I don't know what. what 
Yeah. And, and it seems like saying that we've done nothing in the past 10 years also sounds pretty bad, too. Um, it, where, 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 where did that come from? Uh, I found that number um, off of Wikipedia. Okay. So it's not 100% correct, but... Um, so one thing is, like, you, it, you know, it depends on how you measure accuracy. So if you measure it, like, word, for, word by word, you get one number, and then if you say, well, did you get the whole sentence right? Yeah. You get a different number. And, of course, the chances that you're going to make one mistake in a whole sentence are much larger. Yeah, so you can get exactly. A accuracy but, you know, in a sense, it depends whether you want to report a big number or a small number. Right? Yeah. You know, it's, all, it's all games. Because 80%, that would be pretty annoying. Every, you know, every time you were using the phone to say your credit card number, it gets it wrong. You know, one time five, you, you know, yeah, I think it also depends on how clearly, clearly you're speaking. Because I know I use the uh, speech-to-text for, for the phones. And, uh, you know, some of my, I'm not speaking exactly, like, clear. I'm not, maybe I'm not enunciating the whole thing. And it'll get it wrong. And then I'll just say, oh, no, that was wrong. And then I'll just click it again and really enunciate it, and it'll usually get it right the second time. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was what I was thinking about that IBM system you described. Because, like, pitch is not, you know, you can say the same word with different pitches. Yeah. And so it's like, you wouldn't think that would be the only time But the guy, if he can learn, like, every time I say five, I say five, whatever, yeah. then, you know, he can, he can learn to drive it. And that, that works, but it's kind of, it's, it's like, which is, which is, is it the machine serving human or the human serving the machine? Exactly. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. I wonder, is, is there any numbers of you have any like, statistics on like, languages different than English? That's an interesting question. Uh, no, I, I, I think everything, all the statistics that I was looking at was, was English. But uh, that's definitely, that would be definitely something interesting to look into. Um, I don't know. It's a really good question. You know, because um, just historically, <laughs> most of the research and research funding has come from the US. And so, you know, American English is just like much better served than all other languages. But, you know, there, but there is an opportunity for people to develop languages. In fact, one of the, one of the you know, so the, the way these systems work is like you mentioned, you know, like the, the, the Google system, which had whatever it is, a trillion mm -hmm. months they need training data. And, uh, and they get better the more training data you have. And so for something like English, it's quite easy to get a lot of training data. But for some languages, you know, maybe a language which is only spoken by a few million people, like you know, Hungarian or something, it's like it's a whole different problem. And like, well, it's an interesting research challenge. How do we go to recognize that for a language where we don't have the kinds of volumes of training data? And so that's, that's it is much worse, definitely. And I think English is much worse, but it's an interesting challenge to try and see how you get around it. And I think a lot of other languages are more difficult because a lot of languages other than English have more emphasis on when you hit accents. And uh, so I'm not sure if that would actually hurt the speech recognition or help it, depending if you're saying it correctly <coughs> or not. But right, so there are these big differences like, you know, the Mandarin Chinese, which uses the pitch to determine different words, which is something that doesn't work, doesn't have in English. And so, you know, all these, all these machines which have been built to deal with English, it's like, well, I have assumptions, and then suddenly the assumptions aren't bad anymore. But, yeah. I think, I mean, the interesting thing is, like, there are these people, there are these linguists and phoneticians who study this stuff, and then there are the engineers who come along and sort of ignore what they've done and then have to rediscover it the hard way. But, um, but there's some, there's some conversion. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the two models, the acoustic and the language model. And obviously it's a relation between the uh, language and the pronunciation. <laughs> so if, we're, if the vocabulary is becoming larger, we may see some words with different pronunciations and different pronunciations a uh, same differentiation with different words. Mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, that's so. Like, T H E R E versus T H E I E. Uh, I guess that would have to. That, that's. 
so the acoustic modeling w could potentially catch would definitely catch both of those words those words with the same pronunciation but then the language modeling would know that um, whatever word you said before you said there is uh, it's looking for a certain type of word so I think that them working together is the main imp is the real important thing for that case I think it's just about machine learning, which I like. Uh, uh, to like there is a feature and there is a tree, and behind a, behind a tree there is there is a box. And uh, uh, by our whole human beings, uh, human beings experience, and uh, we will, will not think it's a tree box. We will think it's one box. Yeah. So <coughs> we just use uh, uh, different sentences according to the habits of the human beings language, and then uh, input into the machine, then uh, implement it with the machine learning training model and then can, can predict the <coughs> right answer, relatively right answer. Yeah. Right, which is I mean which is the same that we do, right? Because obviously we can't if someone says a sentence with the sound there in it, you don't know which spelling that is until you listen to the rest of the sentence and it's like, oh okay, well, one of these words is grammatically valid and one of them isn't. And but the language model is exactly that. And it's, it's what you say, it's a statistical model of the likelihood of this word occurring given the other words and this find the most likely word. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Okay, so my oh, you give like the mic, yeah. <laughs> Which mic are you saying? <laughs> Okay, um, my topic is autocorrelation and how it relates to music or audio applications. Uh, so first I want to define correlation. Uh, correlation is a measure of likeness of two waveforms wave as a function of a lag in time in one of them. Uh, so we've seen this a lot in math. Uh, we use the convolution a lot. and. The only difference here is that the convolution, we have to actually reverse one of the signals. Uh, in this case, we're taking two different signals and we're seeing how closely the two of them relate to each other. Uh, so there's two types of signals that we usually encounter. One is a continuous signal and the other is a discrete one. Uh, so below here, I have the two uh, correlation equations. So you have your one signal F and G and one is time lagged. Uh, the reason for using correlation in the real world would be if you have a product, let's say like corn, uh, if it's really popular in certain areas, uh, the price goes up. If it's not so much in other areas, the price goes down. So one of the functions would be product while the other one would be price and how closely those two uh, are related is what we're looking here in correlation. Uh, the reason we use correlation is because we, in the future, want to predict something. Uh, if we have data that shows that certain parts of the world uh, corn prices are high, we'll assume for like down the road that's going to continue to do so unless there's some sort of extenuating circumstances. Uh, another example would be like an appliance store, for instance, and during the winter their stock of ACs would be down. Uh, there's no reason to really have a huge inventory when they aren't really in high demand. So companies or businesses can use correlation techniques to sort of predict uh, what types of goods or services to provide or what type of price and how they should fare on those. Uh, so now going to correlation, uh, autocorrelation, we're actually looking at a correlation, but instead of two different signals, we're looking at a signal in itself. Uh, two main reasons, or two main sort of science reasons for using autocorrelation. Uh, one would be in statistics and the other would be in signal processing. Uh, in statistics, we're mostly concerned with some sort of actual uh, value that relates the signal in itself. Uh, so this value is called the autocorrelation coefficient. And the values vary between minus one and one. Minus one meaning that the signal in itself at two points in time are completely uncorrelated, whereas one would mean that they're 
100% correlated. Um, so we're basically looking at the same signal but in two points in time. So if you're looking, for instance, at weather data in March of 2010, and you compare it to weather data March in two, 2009, uh, you're looking to see whether it's rainy or sunny and how closely the weather in March in one year matches the weather in March in another year. Uh, if the weather is exactly the same, you'll get a number close to one, and if it's not, you'll get a minus one. So in our case, we're usually looking for signal processing data. So we're not as concerned with the actual coefficient value, but instead we're looking to use certain types of algorithms to analyze uh, our signal. And so if we go back to the previous slide, in order to get that coefficient, we normalize um, our correlation. And so we have the mean and variance there to do so. And by doing so, we get a scale-free measurement, which gives us the minus one or one, or any value in between without units. Um, so this is a small example of an autocorrelation analysis. So as you can see in the beginning of the signal, we have a high correlation, um, and it varies as we do different samples in time. So the highest you can get is a minus one, the lowest is a, I'm sorry, the highest you can get is a plus one, the lowest you can get is a minus one, but here we get about 2.4. Um, so some properties of autocorrelation include uh, symmetry due to it being an even function. Um, also, if we have a continuous signal that we're looking to model, uh, usually the function reaches its peak at around the origin. Uh, also, if you take the autocorrelation of a periodic function, you'll get a period, a periodic function having the same period as a signal. Um, a good use for this outside of music would be with stock analysis. Uh, so if you're looking at a certain particular stock and you want to know whether to buy or sell, um, if it historically has a high autocorrelation, you can assume that it will continue to do so. Uh, so throughout March again, if the stock is historically high, at the end of February you want to buy as much as possible because you'll assume based on your statistics that it will continue to grow throughout March. Um, so specifically dealing with music processing, uh, we use autocorrelation to detect repeated patterns in a signal. Uh, we also use it to detect presence of periodic signals that may be covered in noise. Um, we're also able to identify the fundamental frequency if there's many harmonics that are detected. So if we don't know what that fundamental frequency is uh, due to noise, we can actually use algorithms to detect different harmonics, which will eventually give us that fundamental frequency. Um, so in terms of music, uh, a lot of us have heard in popular music the use of the auto-tune auto -tune software. And that type of software uses your voice against itself. And so what it does is it uses a phase vocoder and what that does is it takes your voice and it breaks it from like a time domain to a frequency domain analysis. And what you can do then is you can apply different algorithms to sort of analyze your, your pitch or amplitudes. And then you can actually use uh, Fourier techniques to revert the signal back. And so the way this works is if you're, as a singer, trying to hit a certain note, and you sort of come close to that note, the, the auto-tune program will actually play the correct pitch that you were trying to hit. So it basically makes for lazy singing. As long as you get close enough, the program will spit out a perfectly pitched tone. Um, and so a lot of artists have experimented with it, uh, especially in a recording studio, but it's actually becoming more prevalent in live performances. 
uh, live performances, you're more prone to error than you are in the recording studio. So some artists use the auto-tune and the audience is none the wiser because they're just hearing perfect sound and it's coming from uh, the singer. So instead of, so pitch correcting is the most popular use in music. Uh, so autocorrelation is what allows that to happen. I think that's the end of that. Yeah. Sure. Well, it needs to actually take a sample of your voice in order to determine um, the data that's coming in. And so if you sort of give it a range of, like this is, you hit the actual pitch and it'll say, okay, this is what this person sounds like when they're trying to hit this certain note. And so if you, that same voice comes in and hits relatively near that note, the program will automatically spit out the recording of that perfectly pitched note. So as long as you can come close to it, it'll realize the note that you're trying to hit. And so instead of your actual voice coming out, it'll be the recording of the higher, of the correctly pitched note. So with any luck, we'll, we'll actually be able to you know, try and build a auto tune type system. Mm -hmm. It's significantly inferior. Last year, what we got to was significantly inferior to the commercial ones, but it, it'll just get it. And you know there there are two parts. There's there's the thing that generates the nice sample for us, and the, in order to drive that, there's the thing that tells you what what note it actually is. And so the autocorrelation is, is the first part, and then you have to do something else after pay code. Yeah, that's the main part of that, but the basic math behind it's the autocorrelation. So, so I don't know if you know this. So when they do when they use a live. Isn't, I would imagine if you have to record it first and then spit it out, isn't there some input output lag and like in music that's pretty important if like the singer is like even like a couple of milliseconds behind what like people are playing, I feel like. Yeah, that's why it's it's not used too much in the live. It's more I mean that's why live music doesn't sound nearly as perfect as recorded music does. In the recording studio you can the delay is irrelevant. Yeah, well, I was just wondering if you know how they dealt with that to how the instrument then like delay. I'm not exactly sure <laughs> on how the lag no, works. It's a good question. I don't know. I, I agree that it seems like you need, you know, at least a few cycles because you've got to decide what the pitch is and you can't do that until you've seen like two or three cycles. So you're talking, you know, tens of milliseconds at the very least. Maybe it's some artistic creativity behind the person yeah. singing but uh, <laughs> holding it no longer. Yeah, they probably know when they'll need the help. Yeah. <laughs> so they're ready. And they they already have their scores. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe maybe we can try and find out. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks again. Okay, so Thank, yeah, thank you both for um, giving us a great start for that. Um, that was just the kind of thing. That was just the kind of thing that I want to do, right? So it's just a, a brief presentation. I guess they were a little longer than five minutes, but that's. I mean, we we spun them out a little bit with with questions. Um, you know, general topics of of interest to us the rest of the class, and um, you know, something that we can we can discuss afterwards. That's all. That's all very nice. Um, we, uh, I guess, right now, we don't have anyone signed up for next week, but please do because, I, like I say, we need to we need to make sure that we hit 
two presentations every week so we can get through everybody by, by the end of the semester. Um, and if you have, you know, if you, wanna, if you want any, any suggestions for topics, I might try and put together a list of topics. Uh, one thing, somebody was asking about tuning, musical tuning, which I don't think I mentioned anywhere in the lectures. But, you know, like the whole equal temperament, just temperament thing. That would be a good topic to do. Um, certainly this, this issue of uh, maybe uh, if someone could find, you know, someone could look at auto-tuning, the auto-tuning technology and see what, what really, you know, what the lags are or what people say about that. Something like that. And anything like that would be great. Um, okay, any questions? All right, so the, um, what I want to do now is this practical thing, and basically it's a, uh, we're going to drive it from the website here. So if we go to the, the class homepage, and you go to the practicals, then this is where we're going we're gonna to have it. So every week I'll put up another one of these, which uh, gives, basically it's self-contained. It's self it describes what, what, you, what, what you're supposed to do, and provides some code. And so this, this week we're going to be playing with um, processing, and we're going to be playing with both the, uh, the spectrogram code that I showed a week ago and the plucked string code that I showed on Monday. And so these, are, these links here are the actual sketches. So if you click on this, you get the code. I get the code in my web browser. And you can just copy this. And then if you're running processing, you can just you know, bring up, I did file new, new to get a new window. And you should be able to just paste that stuff in. And then you get the code there, and then you can just run it like that. Is that going to work? Yeah, so, yes. Uh, yeah, so that, that's, you know, that's how it's, it's that simple. You can download it as a file and read it in. But basically, you know, the whole point about processing is it's this very interactive thing, and you can just cut and paste and run and, and play with it like that. So that's the, uh, that's the practice the practicalities of how you can get this code and you can try running it. And so basically there are a couple of different code, ba code starting points, the spectrogram code and the plug string code. The plug string code which we saw on Monday, actually there was one thing I didn't show you then, which I, so I'm just pasting that in the same window now. Um, up here you've got this um, fundamental frequency and it's, there was an audio frequency, but if you make it very slow like this, it actually still works, surprisingly. Um, but now you can sort of see the, uh, basically what it does, it's simulating a very, very long string now. And what that means is you can actually see the individual waves uh, traveling backwards and forwards, which I guess, I didn't, you know, we didn't really see this live, but remember I said about the, um, about the, the, the way it works on strings, you have these traveling waves moving in opposite directions. And this is the, guess, you, know, you can sort of see that there are waves traveling this way in the red, and waves traveling this way in the blue, and then the white is the summation of these two, so they have these pulses moving against each other. So you can actually see, with this simulation, you can see those two traveling waves and how they mix together. Um, and then on the website, I linked to a couple of YouTube videos where they actually have... Um, you know, high-speed photography of real strings showing this happening. And it's not exactly like that, but it's amazing how close it really is. And, you know, there's some really interesting videos there. Okay, so you can... Here, this is the, the plug string code, which, again, the code is a little more complex than the other one because I did it through this by defining my own Java class with these different methods. But hopefully, if you've got the starting code, you can, you can modify that and play with it. But then... What I, what I give you here is a, a set of different ideas of things you could try. So for the spectrogram code, you can try changing the um, size of the buffer to get different time frequency trade-offs. Right? We saw that when we talked about it, that if you have a very short window, you get a lot of time resolution, but the, the frequencies blur together. If you have a long window, you can see individual frequencies very cl clearly, but you, don't, you can't, everything gets blurred out in time. 
So you can try building different versions of that, or you might, if you feel ambitious, you might try um, writing some code such that the window length actually changes in response interactively, like maybe through the mouse buttons or through a key press or something like that. Um, we're going to get on to looking at log frequency because it turns out the music, music is sort of more sensibly displayed on the log frequency axis. So you could also think about how you might change the display here so that rather than having a linear frequency display, you have a logarithmic frequency axis. Um, and then, or you could choose to look at the plucked string code and uh, play with some of the variables there to see what, what kind of sounds you get out. And there are a bunch of different things. And I also have this, this version here where I basically merge the two programs. So it's, uh, um, it's the plug string code, but it also runs a spectrogram on that code, on that sound at the same time. So you sort of have these two things on top of each other if it works. Let's see. So you, sort of, you can plug the string, but then it draws the, uh, the spectrogram of what you're hearing directly underneath. It's sort of what we were trying to do last time where we had the plug string in one window and the spectrogram running at the same time, which you can also do. But here, uh, you just, you know, it guarantees that what the spectrogram is showing you is just that string. And so this is quite interesting because then you can see the, um, the different effects of, of, you know, different kind of plucking points and the way I, the way I do this, uh, you know, different pluck shapes. So it gives you a nice way to, to play with that. And then um, you can investigate, you know, just what it is that dictates the, the difference in the sound, how the difference in the sound you know, relates to the plucking shape, plucking point, um, and how it relates to the spectrum. And then, you know, you can just sort of treat it as a scientific thing to try and make sense of what's going on there. So, um, yeah, so just go ahead, and then what we'll carry, just start doing that. We'll do it for like 25 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, have, a, have a quick roundup at the end, and we'll sort of get comments from people uh, to just who want to share the things they found. Okay, so hopefully... Has everyone got access to a machine, their own machine or someone you know, you're very welcome to work in, in groups? Does that going to work out? And then me and the Stark will come around and, and talk to you to check to see what's happening. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> that is weird. I mean, the damping one works, maybe I could just use that one. Yeah, but I'd like to know what's going on here. Yeah. So, I, I've seen this stuff. Um, can we, um, but sometimes, wait, which one was it? Oh, it's this one. Is this one? Yeah, this one. But, you know,
um, I've seen this before, and it's like, well, you know, because it's sort of it's trying to do all this stuff to. Um, to make the, the fact that we're using Java mm-hmm. as, as invisible and as painless as possible, it's sort of like, well, you know, there's, some of these problems are a little bit hard. Like, how do you actually get, you know, there's no separate, like, um, definition of a class from, from its implementation like you'd normally get. And so it's just like, well, how, how how does it know that this class exists given the definition of the class is later in the file? And it's sort of, I don't know how it does that, but it does do it sometimes. But, um, oh, look at that. The nested type cut string can be found in closing time. The nested type cut string can be found in any closing time. Did I miss maybe? Did I miss like a? No, 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 no. It's not you. It's definitely this is just processing being weird. It's just like you know, eventually. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's yeah. So I tried to just close processing and. Uh, Open it again. <coughs> Wait, what happened here? Okay. Every Monday is lecture. And then after that, we have this practical where we can uh, play with uh, different types of code as we then to the topic. All right, I, yeah, I can't figure it out right now. Okay, just that's fine. I just use okay. the damping version. Okay, it's not that much, right? No, no, but it's just a little more complex. That's okay. okay. Yeah, it's just a practice. Yeah, it's just a practice. It's like, uh, yeah. so it's like uh, online. Uh, 
I think I think the well the network. Yeah. I think the network is overloaded, so it's not. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. But hang on, I'm, I'm trying to set up this as a my machine as a as a as a, no, as a node. sharing. So there should, I just set up my machine as a, a wireless access point. There should be a network called DPWE something, which may work. Yeah, DPWE underscore MacBook should work. <laughs> So uh, for internet access, uh, trying to uh, use this network. Is there anyone having trouble with that? Uh, 
internet connection or um, processing not working? Did you try that? Try this one.
他就定了这个 Instagram， 就是说他已经在推这个，一个新的网红，呃，百度的每个人都是他的，一定要去看这个，多少年追星了，呃，他是不是他是不是那种运动赛，运动赛才三百万就传出来，应该就是说，就是 sample rate， 就是 sample rate， 一个 sample rate 多少倍数？还得说，不是，不是 sample rate， 那个八分钱，那个八分钱。八分三，八分三，三分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，八分三，
Say this is a process, and we're trying to, uh, you know, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll keep working on. Hopefully, you know, there are a few teething troubles with the network, and we're getting processing installed, and with this whole what we're trying to do in here. Basically, this is this is this is how it's meant to be, right? That you try try some, get some code, try it out, just experiment with stuff, ask questions, discover things. Now, what I want to do at the end of these sessions is to have a, a period where. People can, uh, you know, just make um, impromptu presentations of anything that they've discovered. So, has anyone? Well, we we're, maybe presentations is putting too strong a word on it. So let's let's just see. What? How did people get on? Did anyone discover anything interesting? Anything they want to share? Anything they want to talk about? What they were doing? <laughs> you made it work. But let's talk about the actual. Um, what did we discover about the plug string or about the spectrogram? 
So I was just talking to, to Lucia about um, the problem of like when you du when you double the in the spectrogram. Do I have a spectrogram here? Yeah. So here's the spectrogram, and the question one of the one of the issues was can we change the frequency resolution here? What happens when we change the buffer size? So my spectrogram's black on no yeah black and white. So that's whistling at about, according to the label <coughs> there, it's about 1,300 hertz, right? Um, and the scale goes from 0 to 5,000. Now, if I um, change the buffer size here to make it like twice as big, um, what happens is I still get this whistle at about 1,300 hertz, but now the... Um, the scale is only up to 2,500 hertz rather than 5,000 hertz. So by making the window length twice as long, I basically got twice as many pixels um, for the same, twice as many pixels for the same frequency chunk. And then when I plotted them, because I kept the size of each pixel the same, now only half as much frequency shows up. Yeah? How could your whistle have been primarily around 1,300 hertz, is my question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good question. But that's outside of like no brain. Yes. <laughs> I'm just here. All right. Let's just Thank try you. that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I wish I had a, a one I could run. So yeah, that's definitely wrong. Good. Thank you for for pointing that out. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I now have I have the same thing running on my on my iPhone. says the same thing. <laughs> that is... Really good overtones. <laughs> no, so 1300 hertz is, is not inaudible, but it's, it's not, that doesn't sound right. It's on the north 13? side of audible, yeah. No, 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 that would be 13,000 would be, would be much too high. Um, so here is a signal generator Um, why isn't it working? Mute. Okay. That's my that's my function generator running at thirty hundred hertz. So that's actually that, that's right. So this is like four forty hertz, which is the thing, right? Which is the note, the note that the plug string was playing, and so an octave above that is eight eighty hertz. And then 1300 hertz is a little bit above that. So, okay. So yeah, no, it is 1300 hertz. Okay. You, 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 you had me. I had the same. I, I felt the same way as you that it was not right, but actually it is right. Okay. Look here. We here. We, you can even see it on the screen. That's been listening to the thing. Okay. So no, 1300 hertz. That's what I'm whistling at. There you go. Phew. Um, okay. So now the question was, what happens when you double the window length? Well, when you double the window length, you get twice as many pixels. And basically, the way the spectrogram works is it plots one pixel per FFT bin. So if you have twice as many pixels, it only fits in half as much at the frequency range. And conversely, if you have a much shorter window, like maybe 256, then now with a 256 point FFT is going to give us from a this sampling rate, which is 22 kilohertz, it's going to be bin 0 will be 0 hertz, bin 256 or 255 will be 22 kilohertz, but only you only get valid, you only get interesting information up to the to Nyquist rate, half the sampling rate. So basically, only the bottom 128 bins are going to be useful. And so, what we hear, see here is that there's sort of 128 pixels of stuff, and there's 1300 hertz down there. Here's 1100 hertz, which is where the Nyquist rate is. And everything above here basically just apparently just copies. Oh, it does try. It, the code tries to read back bins for frequencies higher than, higher than Nyquist rate. All right, so this is, here's what it does. It uses the, this is where it's, oops. This is where it fills in the values it's going to use in the spectrogram. And uh, it basically calls FFT get banned, but it calls FFT get banned for an index that's beyond the top of what the FFT object knows is valid. And so it just repeats the, uh, 
it repeats the, the, the top value. And so that's what we're seeing, sort of uh, this thing getting replicated all the way up. And so these are the only valid, valid things. Yeah. What is the thousand for? Um, this is just scaling, right? So I just, I just make it a thousand times larger. And then I'm using log 10, so this becomes dB. And then I change it into, and it becomes a grayscale. So it's sort of, it's, if I didn't have a thousand, I guess it would just be a lot. It wouldn't, you know, we'd, ha we'd have to work a lot harder to get the screen, to get the thing to appear. Yeah. So you can get it, but it's much dimmer. Yeah. So um, one obvious thing that came up in this was like, it would be nice to um, have this so that when the, the number of pixels in the spectrum changes, the sort of the size of the pixels changes so that the, you know, you always get the same amount of frequency flooded. But that's a little bit hard because the way I do it here to plot the actual points is, um, this is where I would draw in the points. Stroke sets the color of the point, so I set the color, or in this case the grayscale, because I set to a, a scale of value. It's between 0 and 255, so I just pick out the value from the spectrogram and set up the grayscale. And then I use point, which just sets a single pixel. If I wanted to set multiple pixels, I'd have to maybe use a line, a little vertical line segment, something like that. And then that would, that would scale it appropriately. Or maybe a rect, I don't know, to fill in a whole block of stuff. So we could... Um, I, this is height minus j, right? So we could change this and we get scaling, but I don't want to do it right now. Okay, any other, any other comments or experiences that we can just discuss quickly now? I have just a, uh, have a very quick question. Yeah. Uh, uh, like uh, there is the improvement of, uh, we have already, but it is about pass string and we use a filter to load pass filter, it is a uh, FYR filter, so I was wondering if we can change it to a IR filter. Is it possible to change the IIR filter, or what is the limitation of the upper, unlimited up yeah. order of the filter? Yeah. So we can change it to the 100 order or 30 orders. Yeah, you could change it to an IIR filter. You'd have to build a separate filter structure at the end there. But basically, that filter just takes as input the positive going wave, and its output is the negative going wave. And so, you know, that's just to an input and output sequence. You can define an IR filter there. But, um, I, the, the, you want, I don't know, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> and the point of that filter is not meant to be anything complicated. It's meant to be just a very simple low-pass filter to simulate the fact that high frequencies are reflected a little less efficiently than low frequencies. And, uh, you know, that's why the high frequencies die out more quickly in the plug string, which is sort of gives it a very realistic sound, because that's actually what happens in, in real systems, that high frequency typically use, loses more energy than low frequency. Um, but with a, with a more complex filter, you might actually get different resonances, like certain bands die out more rapidly than others, yeah. and you could get a more interesting uh, tone possible. All right, great. So that basically um, went pretty much like I hope. Um, again, this is experimental. If you have any suggestions on how we can improve the, the, the flow of these sessions, then please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Monday for the next lecture. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.